So let me introduce myself. My name is Henry Crawford, and I feel truly honored to be uh, producing this program tonight. So um, let me bring on Grace Cavalieri. Thank you. She is Maryland's 10th poet laureate, a prolific writer and visual artist. These are the poems and paintings of Grace Cavalieri. And wow, I like that setup. Henry, thank you for producing this so much. I could never do the technical. And Catherine, I love you for including me in this group every five years. Um, this is the book. It's called Grace Art. And to my surprise, a publisher just saw some of my paintings and said, let's put them together in a book. And I thought that was awfully nice of him. So I'm going to um, describe that. Th these, these are the first ones. I have about 70 paintings now in houses oh. all over America. Luckily, I have a big extended family and um, friends. So I put together the book in a way that was not exactly methodical. I put poems with each painting, though they are not ekphrastic. They don't describe the painting or the, illustrate it with words. I just picked randomly poems that kind of had a thread that might be connected to the painting because I'm a big lover of random. I Everything I do has to do with collecting fragments and seeing it come together. So I don't worry too much about conformity, as you know. <laughs> so this is Grace Art and let us have the first painting uh, the first slide okay this slide is called blood path and it was asked of me by herbert woodward martin who is um, a fabulous poet and did a book about a man who was mugged and then in the hospital they found that he had aids from this from being hospitalized so the book is called please say my name it's a true story and this, he wanted something which personified what it might feel like to have AIDS. And so Blood Path was the first uh, painting I did actually, and it's one I still own. It's in his book. And then for the poem that went with it, I didn't care about talking about the painting or the process. I just chose a, a poem from a book of mine that kind of, has a tone to it. It's called Stunned. I don't know about dropping a full bottle of wine on the pavement in Pisa, or both leaving our hats in the locker room in Maryland on the same day, or talking about our neighbor in West Virginia who killed his cat. As we stand hand in hand, looking at the milk of the moon shining on the whole world, I alive, you dead, saying, if this could happen, anything could. So that was my first painting. And then Henry, we can go to the next one. This is very special to me because it, it introduced me to an idea of just starting with dots. And I thought, if I just start with dots, what possibly can, they, where will they take me? What will happen? So I was boiling potatoes, I remember distinctly. And this is on, canvas was in my uh, other room right next to the kitchen. And I just went in and put some five dots down and that was it. The next day, if you have five dots, you're very much invited for five more dots. But never did I imagine that I should sit there and do a painting because it's not a chess, it's not a chess game. It's not an end game to me. It is just um, surprising myself every minute. So I was very happy to just put a little dash of yellow. And then the next day I came and I put a swish of red. And then the next day there was no, nothing at stake. Nothing could fail because how can anyone oppose to dots? I mean, dots are like humming, it's not competitive. So. I found a way through this painting to allow myself to conduct color. It's like I would say it took 
couple of weeks to dot around with this painting. And it's owned by a spiritual leader in California. And it gives me such great pleasure to think of this being in Brian Christopher's house. It makes me so happy because it's like my energy is there. So let's go to the next energy. This again was chosen for Herbert Woodward Martin's book um, about AIDS, about the decline of a man dying of AIDS. And it was such a mess. As you can see, I keep painting over things. You can see the veins in the right-hand side. It's called, this is called diagnosis. But I kept painting over and making mistakes. And then I liked that the veins showed through on the right-hand side. And there, the interesting thing about this one for me is that it worked no matter where I turned it because I, I don't know much, but I do know that there's supposed to be color, composition and structure. And for some reason, every time I turned this, it, it worked out. So when I submitted this to the publisher, I, I sent him four variations of it and didn't even know which one he'd choose. So he chose this one, which I, think is okay. It's called diagnosis. And it, to me, it has all the horror and the terror and the awakeness of being told that you will not live for very long. There's an awakeness about that, I believe. The next one, the next slide, Henry. My neighbor said he never owned an original painting <laughs> in his whole life. So he said he'd love to have an original painting. Well, I found that a little bit scary because, you know, something was expected of me. I couldn't just dot around happily. He happened to be a sailor of some note as being an Annapolis resident. So I fooled around and I ma managed to get a, my idea of a sailboat, which shows I don't know much about sailing, but I was happy to discover that if I took my brush and pushed it hard, the hard part against the canvas, I could get a real weathered look. This is called Escape. And um, the poem I chose to go with it in the book is about, well, my, I have a friend who's a nurse and she goes all over the world helping third world country children's and orphanages. And she's just such a, a great person um, that this poem I wrote for her and she gave me once a cactus, a prickly cactus with a red bloom. And that's in this poem and it's called Voyages. This poem never went to Africa to sleep on the floor of a tent or to treat children for scurvy. This poem didn't even get as far as Mexico where it could nestle under the white hot sun in the warm brown sand. In fact, this poem's never been anywhere at all and has led a rather sheltered life. But then again, daring comes from within, as a famous poet once said. And like the red flower blooming on an otherwise green prickly stalk, flames up to the top, radiant and brilliant, as one who dares to give away the precious pebbles of her life and someone else who dares to take them. So you can see that many of um, all of my paintings are for people that I, I love and they have a special quality. Each one is different for that reason. So what is the next one, Henry? My, this is a, a collage I did because um, I have a friend with children and her mother has always been very dear to me. And this mother lives in Maine and her grandchildren come to visit her. So I loved putting her grandchildren there. And you can believe that you can get anything on Amazon. I got shells and I got sea a sand. It's on page 29, Kath Catherine. And um, I, I <laughs> got the seashore from, from Amazon. But I want to point out that the collage would not be of any value if the template behind it had not been made first. So that the colors and the shapes and the direction 
uh, are very important to be the background or else the collage would really not, they'd fall flat actually. So the painting has to be a painting unto itself first. And I think the pink and blue denote to me childhood. And it makes me happy that each summer they visit her in Maine. And she, although she lives in Boston, she has a place in Maine. And then this is the focal point and they all see it together. So that is a great pleasure for me. Um, the next slide is a button tree. Um, this is called, this is says Dylan Price, page 37, Catherine. Um, it was for my great grandchild who's now six and he was four when I did it. You know, nothing's better than buttons. You can't tell me how old you are. I don't care who you are or how accomplished or how rich. A box of buttons is the most wonderful thing. And we all have buttons because they come on all the clothes we wear as if we're actually gonna sew them on things. So we all have these buttons and boxes. And I um, was happy to find something to do. And I say, well, what do you do with buttons? You make a button tree. And he likes it very much. And it is hanging in his bedroom. So that's, um, it will be there forever, I hope. And he's six now. And it was a good use of buttons. Uh, the next one, Henry, is um, this taught me a lot. First of all, if you look at the blue ribbon, I fixed crystals to them in a line because I wanted to draw the eye to the center because it was kind of crazy. So I just wanted to have people not pass out. <laughs> I wanted to give them a focal point. I wanted to give them a focus. It's called Colleen Flynn, Catherine is on page 41. And this again was the greatest pleasure of starting with dots. Now you can just imagine me starting with dots. I might have started at the bottom for all I know. Um, I just, there's just no end to dots. When you put them down, then you can put them in the, something in the middle. Then you each shall have space to do something in the middle of that. And it's like going down a colorful hole where only you live. And it's a, an existence of being five years old again. These are all clearly done by a five-year-old. It's obvious. And that is where I want to be most of the time. I will read a poem that goes to this one because I like the poem <laughs> because it's about being an artist. You are in your own world. No one can get there. I mean, Josephine Jacobson has a beautiful poem about her husband's dreaming and she can't get there. <laughs> he, he, he's one place she can't get. And this is sort of that way. It's being an artist. You have your own world, but you have to sometimes make allowance for your partners. And this is called Advice Regarding a Field of Reindeer in the Snow. If your husband is sleeping, you can leave him a message and go in the airplane with the mysterious pilot just for an hour to land in strange cities, farmlands, perhaps with wet leaves and wooden houses with ruffled curtains you may walk to the edge of what you thought was a forest and look through a thick wall of ice with a gigantic hole and see field after field of reindeer brushed with snow standing still. How beautiful, like frozen statues, cold and silent, each staring straight at you. Line after line of them, a sight you'd never have seen had you stayed home, you'll never forget it. But remember to leave a note before you go or your return will be bleak. It will ruin everything, field, trip, reindeer, snow. And um, that came to me in a dream. I dreamed about this gorgeous 
these reindeer standing there looking at me line after line of them brushed with snow and I was looking through a porthole of ice and I write as soon as I wake up my husband used to say it was like sleeping in a gas station because the, the light would go on and off all night but I always jot down what I dream uh, especially in the morning and that's where the poem came from I cannot justify the way it goes with the painting because it does not as I say I like randomness and but there's something about the line of crystals that one could imagine to be reindeer in the snow. So the next one, Henry, is page 47 is called Shelley Flynn. I sometimes name them for who um, owns them. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because you can see my process is just random dots, circles, lines, whatever works. I go over them a lot so that th this isn't the original pattern. Um, I mess up a lot and I go over with lots of colors, which gives me a kind of a nice texture. But the reason I'm showing you this is a confession because if you look at the center, there is a, a circle of gold. Well, that was a terrible blemish that I could not change. I tried to wipe it out. I tried to paint over it and it just was like a terrible blemish if you see the painting in person. So I put a gold ring around it. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, all that gold ring does is bring people's attention to this terrible blemish. So I made a belt out of it and that worked quite well because it takes the eye away from the hole and yet it looks like it was meant to be. And I can honestly say that 50% of everything I paint is to correct a mistake. And so I like the idea that there's this reason to fail. You go in re wishing to fail so that you can fool around with it and make something out of it. So this has a COVID haiku accompanying it in the book. And it goes, points on a map, growing smaller now, window, porch, street. There was a time when I looked out, all we did was look out windows the first uh, 12 months, I believe. And the next one, Henry, is that same uh, method of highly uh, textured colors. This is called Rose Solari on page 51. I started adding ink pens, gold pens, to emphasize what I wanted to, to say. But Rose loves blue. And I'll, I'll be damned if I could get this to be blue. There is blue in it. But this is one painting that absolutely went red. And try as I would, it wanted to be what it wanted to be. And I was stop, I stopped fighting with it and just said, sent it to Rose for her anniversary and said, um, there's some blue in here. <laughs> but sometimes you have to surrender and not be so dog headed and not be so stubborn about it and just say, okay, Red, you, you win Red, You're, it's fine, it's fine. The next one is my autobiography. This again was a, a total failure. I will actually take a painting and put it under a table until it behaves. I'll actually put it under a table and say, you just stay there until you can act better. So this was under the table and the right hand was absolutely, I just could not get it to do anything that I wanted to do. So I collaged it, which is, mm, this is called autobiography and it's on page 61, Catherine. But it worked out well for me. All my failures work out very well because as you can see, everything in my life is on the right-hand side. The bottom right partial face is Joy Harjo, the United States Poet Laureate. So I have my Poets Laureate there. I have um, 
On the right hand side, words, which are my way of life. Uh, on the top right are books and a bookshelf, which certainly denotes my life. The American Eagle, which I still believe in, the fierceness and the beauty of our institutions. Um, then I have protesting on the bottom because I very much am an activist and costumery. But if you look closely, if you had the book, you would see five kitty cats hidden in this array, five kitty cats. Now on the left-hand side, it's a celebration of life, whether it's confetti or champagne. But the funny thing about this is that you can see I've gone over it so many times, but the, the Zhao Gallery in Chicago wanted to take this and exhibit it. But then they said, we don't like the bubbles on the paint. And I said, you, that's, that's nothing. You should see the rest of it, really. So um, it, I'm not probably going to get in galleries until I, why, until I get serious about not playing so much, but I don't absolutely care. Then I wrote a, I have a poem which is kind of making fun of myself and it's called Awards Day. So I stuck that in, Awards Day. She always wanted to make love to a clock so she'd know when to stop. She always wanted to be standing in the limelight in a white satin dress. No, make that a strapless dress. Now she was older and so no, make that one with sleeves. She wanted to be a cat hiding in a tree to catch a bird. And those are the awards that we wish for, as silly as they are. So then we're going to move to page 69, which is says Claire Cavalieri because my niece is all about getting an Italian citizenship. She's completely obsessed with being not half Italian, but really moving to Italy. So of course the painting that I did for her has Italian doors and windows and icons and pots of flowers. And once again, however, the template of color is, is really important before you apply the collage. And those of you who have gone to Italy, you know that all the houses are like pinkish stucco or yellowish stucco, sort of pink, yellow, burnt orange. So I naturally had to go to those colors. And because there are houses in this, I chose a poem about a house. It's called Colossus and it's about the house we built and it's about being married for 70 years and how you start on floor one, which is such a fragile floor. And it actually started with the fact that Ken, my ex, my ex husband, my present husband now gone, um, gave me carnations when he, I was 16. Colossus, the house we built. It started with carnations he gave me, age 16. And how they multiplied by the hundreds, making a mosaic basement for our house. Of course, we knew the fragility and decay, how easily they could be crushed. But the glass floor to the first floor was, the glass stair to the first floor was found where we walked carefully so much luggage from our childhood until finally secure on floor one above the drifting past we found the next floor the children the lightning of love the danger of sorrow and then the place above this music swirling skirts yellow cars riding pink through the sunsets of key west toward the roof where we stood in the mist, sun, hail, with a house crumbling beautifully away. Oh, so the next one, Henry, is called Migrations. It's on page 73, it's mixed media. Now, this was inspired in 1950 at the Modern Art Museum in New York 
when I saw a painting by a Russian, and his name is Chelechu, like T C H E L E C E U or something. It's called The Tree of Life. You must Google it. This is no, <laughs> nowhere near it, but his tree of light, when you stood back, it was a perfect tree with each leaf beautifully made. When you got close to it, each leaf was a face. It is something I have remembered since I was 20 something. And it came back to me in 2020, it's funny. But um, to continue, I wrote a book called Migrations in 86 with a world-class photographer who um, illustrated the poems with antique broken dolls. Now there's nothing more painful, I think, than broken dolls. And many people, except for Henry, said it's creepy. But I don't actually think it's creepy. I think it's true. That's different. And so I took one of our books of Migrations. Actually, Migrations became an opera with the composer Vivian Rudo from Baltimore and it became a radio special. And we put on a mixed media at the Franz Bader Gallery in DC, any of you who can remember that one. So this is the painting started with a lot of color and stripes, more than you can imagine, hundreds of colors. Then I didn't worry about loss. My husband, the sculptor, taught me how to discard things. So I just laid things on top of the colors. And I, um, I tell people that all oh, art is not pretty. And so get over it. It's more important to tell the truth about regret, loss, pain, the subterranean world underneath the children who will always go away. So I like this and Henry and I like it. <laughs> so it stays, it stays. And the poem that goes with this, just accidentally actually, is called Migrations. And it says, open wide the windows from the high tower, caught as I am in midair, green still stands outside, inside the children's empty boots left beside the door. In my dream, those voices coming up the hill towards me, children clamoring in with bundles larger than the heart. Let us have lunch. Where is the milk? Can I tell you a story? How I stood beneath the stairs and lowered my eyes so as not to cry. Uh, Lady Di, many of you know this um, poet in Washington, who is um, an African-American poet of great decorum. And I always said to her that she had beauty, unity, truth, integrity, and symmetry. And so she loves those banners. And I wanted to make something that she would consider like her, which was delicate and beautiful. So, I mean, what's not to like about pink, purple, and blue? I mean, you can't really mess up. That's called Lady Die, and it's on page 79, Catherine. And I, I kind of liked the story. I don't know how I did the stripes, but I like the transparency under them in the middle. And I have no idea today where that came from. The poem I'm going to read is called Language. What's there to say about the rose and the dew inside the rose? Who can see the simplicity of hidden light, the unmarked flower, light, dew, Rose, do not know the names for their slight lives. That's why we watch in silence without a need for speech. The sun doesn't know why it's called sun. No matter what is said, we learn by stillness. All that's beautiful will grow. This is page 83. It's called Maria Van Buren. Mixed media again. 
Um, Maria has a, an artist, a writer's retreat every year in New Hampshire. And I've gone every year for 10 years, but for this year because of travel. And she has a lot of things in her yard. She has 140 acres and it's filled with chickens and dogs and hummingbirds. But the thing I wanted to say was how much sparkle she gave me every time I visited, how much love, how much energy, how much brightness was there. And that's why I put sparkles all over that. Sparkles are strange to have in a barnyard, but they really work here because the original painting they actually do show. And um, so this uh, mixed media has sparkles and pen and acrylic and collage. Um, I happen to just pick out a poem randomly. I told you I believe in random. And this is called A Field of Finches Without Sight Still Singing. That song comes from sorrow, there is no doubt. Bullfinches in ancient times had eyes put out so they would sing more sweet. Think of those black beads dropping to earth, coming to seed, flowers turning inward, every single one of them without its sight. Stories say that moving in the wind, they made up song as if nothing had been lost. And this rings long into the night. Every sound we hear turns to a bigger one and each is true. We add our own until it is the first din ever heard, the way poetry begins. The next one is Dot Heaven. Um, it's interesting because I really have in mind the person I make this for. And in America, there are 50, 70 homes with a painting in mind. So it's like a map with my, with my energy dotted all over the map of the United States. This is called Candace Cats and it's on page 85. And all I wanted to do was try to depict what we were to one another. She's, she and I worked at NEH together. She has like a PhD in, a PhD in English. Um, she, has a, a, she writes novels. She's a lawyer. Uh, she has a detective license. I mean, she has all these credentials, but she's so playful. And together we are like just playful people. So when I was doing this, it's just full of hearts and bows and bows and hearts and flowers. And that's the way it is with us. I think it's a very good portrait of our relationship. And I was totally five when I did it. I have a sad poem that goes with this, but it's a gozzle. And since I haven't read anything in form, I, you know, I was hard put to put poems. The publisher wanted the paintings, the publisher wanted poems. There was just no way I could do it sensibly. So I didn't try. This is called a green gozzle. Now a gozzle is a certain form that's Persian. And you keep saying the same word. In the first couplet, you say the same word twice at the end. And then in each other couplet, you say the second line with that same word, a green gazelle. Green grass rises and rises, rises season after season. My husband's heart there season after season. Green is the color of my true love's hair. I hear it ticking under the earth season after season. I closed the green hospital curtains and said, rest, then said, no, wait. I think of this season after season. When young, I lost my gold bull of a watch in the ocean, ticking in green foam, season after season. Legends are based on these small parts of the voice, how the range of oceans is big and fearless, season after season. 
bushes stay green after azalea blossoms float away. This is graceful of spring after leaving, season after season. The trick of this is the poet has to put her last name in the last line, as Henry knows. So luckily I could use graceful. This is graceful of spring before leaving season after season. Some names are easier than others to put in a gazel. The next one, Henry, is this is um, actually like the second one I did. I was trying to see how you make transparencies. Everything I did was trying to see how you did it. How, did, how does this happen? How do people do this? So I put on, as you see, the colors, and then I put on shapes. And I actually, I think that the one on the bottom right is my, a paddle from my kitchen, a cooking paddle. And a couple of squares and a couple of circles. Um, and then I think I might have taken a wet brush and wiped away the color. But that doesn't explain the ones on the left that overlap each other with three colors. So someone asked me to do one and I said, I couldn't possibly do it. She said, you did it, you can do it again. So I'm going to try it again and see how I did it. If I can imagine it once, I can imagine it twice. But right now looking at it, I, I really can't recall. I think it has to do with wiping things away like erasures. And um, it's called transparency and it's on page 97. The next one, it's called Riceville Beach, page 99. And my daughter goes to North Carolina to vacation. And I've never, I didn't go with her, but I wanted to think what it might be like. So once again, I used the hard part of my brush to hurt the canvas, hurt the paint, to weather it, to look weathered. And then to me, it looks like Wrightsville Beach, what I imagine, it looks like I can see the water and I can see the sun and I can see the weathered boards and I can see um, where she goes. But that's just me. But then my students always say, but that's just me. And I always reply, well, who else could it possibly be? But that's just me. So um, I would never have to go to Wrightsville Beach now because it's hanging in her living room. Since this book, and I don't know how many there are in it, maybe 50, 60, 60 paintings, I have done about a lot more, maybe 60 more because of this. There was a great poet who was named A.R. Ammons, A-M-M-O-N-S. And he said, if you're nothing, you can say and do anything. And I thought, who has, a, I have the credentials. I can do this thing. You know, he really inspired me in 1968. I read his book, Tape for the Turn of the Year, his first book. And he wrote it on a, uh, a cash register tape so that all the poems are very short on the tape. He did what he wanted and he gave me the reason to do it too. So, you know, there's nothing to lose. I have enough children to hang the paintings. <laughs> and a lot of people, one was commissioned, which was a horrible experience because the person wanted a blue one. And then it was too blue. <laughs> so I thought, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> I can't, I, I'm not stable enough to adjust to uh, that. So somebody else got the painting. Henry, actually, Henry, that's your painting. I'm sorry it's secondhand, but he's coming to pick it up Thursday. That is the end of my presentation. And I would just love to see all of you old friends in a gallery view. There you are. Looking quite the same as you did. <laughs> Thank you, Grace.
so lovely. 